I live in West Oakland, which is um, a, just a part of Oakland that's been sort of traumatized. West Oakland is a total food desert, mostly because it's like all liquor stores and they don't make any money selling fresh produce. I had this vegetable garden. I um, dug up my parking strip and planted fava beans and squash. This was an abandoned lot. It still is an abandoned lot. <laughs> um, and so we decided we would just start gardening on it. We went up to the beekeeping place and got our first beehive. And then I started hearing about people that kept backyard chickens. And I thought, well, I can do that. So I raised uh, turkeys and ducks and geese and then rabbits, pigs, goats. Then I started running into people um, who would be like, yeah, I'm an urban farmer. And I'm like, well, what the hell is that? And they're like, well, kind of what you're doing. <laughs> Everything that I do is totally small scale, never like some business model. In an urban farm, you're gonna grow stuff in usually raised beds and you're gonna do this interplanting kind of thing where you're trying to pack as much stuff in as possible into this little space. There's more of an attention to detail for the urban farm. You can go out and actually like hang out with your lettuce plants and like look at them and be like, are they doing well? A lot of people are like, well, why don't you just move to the country? And it's like, well, what I learned was that I could feed the animals from the waste stream. So I would be able to go to these dumpsters of these like, you know, high-end organic um, grocery stores and feed my rabbits. <laughs> One of the biggest triumphs is actually seeing people from my neighborhood come in and harvesting food. It's nice to have community gardens where people can just stop by and pick stuff. And I mean, I love having a garden. I just, you know, I'll just be like, wow, what am I gonna eat for dinner? Well, what's growing out there? Many of my neighbors are from Vietnam or Somalia or Yemen, and those countries have a very um, active urban agriculture scene. And so when they see that I have chickens in the backyard or, you know, goats or anything, they're sort of like, oh yeah, right, just like back home. <laughs> Our particular neighborhood is called Ghost Town. It's because there's so many abandoned lots. There's drug dealers on the street, there's prostitutes, people are growing weed. There are bigger fish to fry in terms of like, what are people gonna call the police because I have pigs? I take the sort of state of anarchy of our neighborhood to my advantage. No, we haven't had bad stuff happen, knock on wood. People are really actually scared of the goats. They always think that they're gonna bite them. So the goats are actually like, keep things pretty protected. The pigs were so much work. They just needed food constantly. They were never satisfied. I had pledged to never buy pig chow as part of my cost-saving um, education. <laughs> so we would go to Chinatown and there's this, um, there's this fish market and we would go to, into their dumpster and there would be all these like fish heads and fish guts and we'd take them home to the pigs and the pigs would scream with delight. They would have like little mackerel, like livers hanging out of their, their mouths and they'd be like shaking. And then I remember just like staring at them and just being like, gross, you know, like this is so gross and I have to keep going back for these fish guts. The pork was really amazing and I value the education, what I learned from the pigs, but this was crazy. I went too far. But I get these emails from people that are like, I read your book and I'm gonna raise two pigs. <laughs> and I'm like, do you not learn from me? Come on. Don't know. Goats were a reaction to pigs in some ways. Every day you're getting something from it. You give it something. And so it's a more symbiotic relationship instead of being always like, well, is it fat enough? Can I eat it? <laughs> They're really weird, funny creatures. They're kind of like cats. You know, they just want to like sit in your lap and cuddle up and, but then they want to get up and like fight and play and stuff. Oh, 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 easy. No, no, no. I just like goat time. Goat time's the best. Most people, if they actually killed an animal and, had, and then that's how they were gonna eat it, would eat no meat. <laughs> like, they would not do it. 
we have slaughtered a goat here and then the rabbits and chickens. And I still feel horrible on days when I know that we're gonna kill an animal. When you raise something, it has a value and it has a connection to your life. It's been in your backyard, you've had interactions with it every day, but it is the logical conclusion of being a farmer and raising an animal. There's some element of paranoia about cooking it because you're like, oh my God, if I overcook this ham, what a waste, what a huge waste that is. I can't emphasize enough how nice it is to have other people around when you're doing these animal processing kind of things because someone might look out their window and see you just like alone like killing an animal, you know, it's just, it's slightly weird. There was this chef, um, Christopher Lee. I was caught in this dumpster, one of his like restaurant dumpsters, and introduced myself as like this insane pig owning person. And um, Chris surprisingly decided to take me under his wing. We made prosciutto, we did like a rolled pancetta. We made soppressetta with the pig's heads. We made lardo. That was kind of an acquired taste. The pigs did eat fish guts, but toward the end of their life they ate um, peaches and cheese mostly, so they really had this wonderful flavor. Living in the city, you're around vegetarians and vegans, and they all have like an idea for what you can do with the turkey instead of kill it, you know, like take it to the refuge, you know, and it's like what they don't understand is that if we just took the turkey to the wildlife refuge, then some other predator would eat it anyway. You're a predator, you know, you got your eyes right here, you know, you're looking forward. Um, and these animals we all eat are wall-eyed <laughs> and they are prey. The vegetables save money. I mean, one like this seed packet or whatever is like a dollar fifty, and then you have way more radishes than you'll ever want. Fruit trees are so awesome. We have an apple, like a five-way grafted apple. We get so much fruit just from this little tiny tree. The most bang for the buck is chard. <laughs> It will produce so much greens because you can keep harvesting over and over and it keeps producing, keeps producing. The goats are totally a boondoggle. I buy them like a bale of alfalfa, which is $18, probably once a week now. So it's a lot, a lot of money that's just like going down the drain. And I mean, if you look at it, like I get a quart of milk every day. Well, like how much would that cost at the store? Like $4? <laughs> It's the biggest concern of urban farming. Most people that move into a house should have their soil tested no matter what, especially if they have kids, because lead is taken up in like the ground, like if there's dirt or something. That's the way that you get lead poisoning, is like breathing it in, not so much eating vegetables that have lead in it. We had the soil tested out here, it was fine. The backyard actually does have lead in it, and so we did this whole like mulch layer, so there's like two feet of wood chips that the animals are on top of. I usually tell people like what they should do is raise beds. Put a root barrier down and then build raised beds that are pretty like sizable. You can grow food in lead, leaded soils, but only food that produces fruit. So you can grow tomatoes, but the leaves will have the lead in it. Predators are a reality. You live in a city, but there are raccoons and opossums and skunks and rats and everything, wild dogs that want to eat your chickens. One night I heard all this like quacking, like, you know, something bad had happened. And then I saw this opossum had killed one of my ducks. And I have a really bad temper. Like, don't cross me. I killed the opossum. I like beat, I basically bludgeoned the opossum to death. One of the neighbors right here in this yellow house came out with a gun <laughs> while I was like bludgeoning the opossum and she handed me the gun. And I was just like, yeah. Then I decided that I would like probably hurt myself with a gun. So then I just ended up killing it with a shovel. I had never seen myself like so mad. But I think part of it was that I had raised them. They were like these little puffball ducklings and they were so cute. And then this thing had just come along and just like killed them like that. If people can, the best thing to do is actually to start from seeds. If somebody else starts them, you have no idea what the circumstances were. And a lot of times they'll get this like fungus or you know some kind of disease. And I call chickens the gateway urban farm animal. They're virtually no work. 
You know, you just have to feed them and put them away at night. And then you get these amazing eggs. The most common beginner mistakes is biting off too much. A lot of times people think that they'll be able to just have like an Insta urban farm, just like buy a bunch of animals and then go for it. You don't have the stamina built up for it. Um, it's like trying to run a marathon without training. What I recommend is that people just start with something that they eat every day. If they love salad and grow some lettuce seeds. You know that you're always rewarded by the thing that you like to eat. Sometimes people are really into like raising rabbits or whatever, but they don't even like rabbit meat. And so that doesn't make any sense. And also like feel free to stop anytime. It's not a progression where you like go to the heights of urban farming. It's like fine, you stop at chickens, you know. The thing that I grow that's stupid is corn. They're super heavy feeders, um, and then you actually don't get that much from it. I mean, the reason I grew corn this year is because I grew like a um, cornmeal type of corn, and I do actually eat that. That's really yummy. Um, and then the goats like to eat the eat the corn. <laughs> Speak of the devil. The goats like to eat the corn stalks, so it's kind of kind of makes sense. When it was time for me to learn how to kill a rabbit. Um, you know, I watched a YouTube video. <laughs> it was just like so easy. So I think that the internet really helps um, and video in particular, watching the videos. The books that have been really good, I mean, still Encyclopedia of Country Living is really great. There's this guy, Hugh Ferling Whitingstall, who is um, a British chef and um, he raises a lot of his own meat and talks about it. And so those kind of books like just make me feel like, okay, I'm not crazy. Like this is like, this is like a thing that, that's really important. A goat herd came up the street blowing his pipes, and a woman who lived on the floor above us came out onto the sidewalk with a big pot. The goat herd chose one of the heavy bagged black milk goats and milked her into the pot while his dog pushed the others onto the sidewalk. So I thought that was so interesting that there was a goat herd that would come into Paris and people would like come down and milk, you know, get their goat milk. What if I got a dog that would herd the goats and I like go up and down the streets of Oakland like blowing a pipe and then like people come out to buy the goat milk. Like wouldn't that be so cool?